Tonight, I'm going to rehouse my Pelinobius muticus, my king baboon. Her name is Maneater. And her name is Maneater for a reason. I haven't <laughs> seen this girl for over a year and I think that she's kind of a legend in my own mind because she was my first really big old world tarantula. And I wasn't really planning on, on having a big king baboon and the guy that I got her from was going out of the hobby after over 30 years and he said put a kitchen colander, a metal strainer over the top of her and he cautioned me she's so mean um, are you sure you want her but I took her and when I rehoused her the first time she threw the catch cup out of my hand she took both of her front feet and just slapped it away and it was kind of frightening at the time but uh, I think today I'm more excited than anything because I just really want to see her she's molted at two, two times since then so she's probably a lot larger and she was probably five at least five or six inches when I got her so she's about six years old now so let's get started variety of things at my disposal here. I might just use this Tupperware uh, for her depending on how big she is. This might be even better because it has lots of holes. The only trouble is the lid is kind of stupid. But we'll see. She's big enough that I don't think she can slip through if I use this lid to uh, put underneath and lift it up a bit. And we'll just see how it goes. She's going to be in this big tub. Um, and This is her new substrate. This is her enclosure. You can see where she has uh, burrowed there. Her opening is over here. She usually hangs out right under that water bowl. But you can see that that substrate's kind of settled. It's been in there for over a year now. So I'm going to get it uh, cleaned up for her and get her in her new place. And uh, I'm sure she'll be restless for a couple days as she, they usually are. The king baboons really like to dig deep down into their substrate and they do not like to be disturbed so she may spend some time trying to get out of her enclosure before settling down i'm going to make sure to try and create some kind of burrow for her so she has a hole to go into and uh, we will take it from there okay i think it's a pretty good rule of thumb to be prepared ahead of time so i have all the tongs that i need over here um, the catch cups, the paint brushes, everything. I do not want to risk harming my beautiful tarantula. I do not want her to escape. Um, I have blocked off the doorway so that none of the other animals in the house can, can enter. And I'm going to put this over her burrow. Um, let me give you a little bit of a view down inside. So that's her burrow right there. She's down in there, I can see her. So let me get, uh, get her out. I'm not, not really gonna mess around here. She does have another, another exit, but she's not using it. I'm actually going to try and crush her substrate. down inside that part of the burrow so she can't go back there. That might be a good idea to put the lid on half of it. Now granted, I know where she's at, so I'm not just randomly poking in here. Okay, she has made absolutely no attempt to um, rise out of there. She's wanting to come out at all, so I'm going to check on her. Oh, we can see her down there. I've 
cleared a path. So I'm going to try from this side. We'll see if she'll run the other way because she probably, she maybe thinks that she can still go the other way in her burrow, but she can't because I, I took it out. I caved it in. So by pressing on her this way, she might think she's fleeing and she might go up into the catch cup. I see. Yep. There you go. Come on, girl. So I'm gonna get a paintbrush. Now that I've got her to move, just by moving the substrate around her, I don't wanna poke her with the tongs. want a lot of dirt in there either because I want to be able to get a good view of her and she's but it looks like she's gonna be a little dirty come on girl I'm gonna be in the way let's go come on okay you know what <laughs> That was nothing, but we're not done yet, so I shouldn't speak, should I? Okay, let's see what we've got here. A very, very pretty tarantula. Okay, now I'm gonna take this substrate out give her tank a nice cleaning with a oh, looks like something tried to somebody tried to eat this probably one of the roaches that was in there who knows what we'll find in the bottom of her burrow after a year I can show you that so I'm gonna go and get something to put this dirt in and I will be right back so I'm just gonna dig down in here we've got a big wall of, of the webbing that she used to block off her entrance. This is where she usually hung out, right on the bottom, and I would always drop water down here for her. The substrate's gotten pretty dry. I don't really wet it a lot. I mean, she likes it dry, unless I see that she's getting ready to molt. Um, so this is all just pretty much dry cocoa fiber, more webbing from her other, her other, um, I guess her exit, um, a little bit of old, let's see, what is this here? Oh, that's a piece of cocoa fiber. Looks like this is an old roach. She did have isopods down and it looks a little bit of mold there, but I think the isopods might have, they might not have made it because it got pretty dry. Um, yeah, just a lot of a little bit musty, <clears throat> nothing bad at all. I used to keep her enclosure a little wetter, but I didn't, she didn't really seem to like it. So I kept it on the drier side. So I'm gonna remove all of this and I will be right back. That's my frog making that sound. There are frogs in here. Um, so I wanted to show you this is where her burrow entrance was. It curved around here and she had an opening here. And then way here in the back of her burrow area is her toilet. So I thought you might be interested in seeing that, that she didn't just poop everywhere. She pooped only back here in this one area that was beyond her living area and that was her toilet. And she used to kind of hang out here, maybe being next to the toilet bothered her. So she started hanging around up here and uh, so I thought that was interesting. I have washed her enclosure out um, in the sink. I used really hot water and a paper towel. I didn't use any chemicals at all. 
Now I'm going to add this mixture. I have cocoa fiber. This time I have it mixed with peat moss. So that is what I am putting in here. Now, since the cocoa fiber tends to um, dry out a bit, I'm going to actually go and get more and put it in here because when it dries out, first she'll puff it up, making her burrow and her webbing, but then um, after a few months it'll start to sink because it'll lose moisture. So I'm actually going to add a little bit more this time. You can see from the consistency that the plain cocoa fiber looks a little drier than the one that's mixed with the peat moss. The peat moss might hold a little bit of moisture in it, so maybe it won't um, sink and flatten as much. I have used potting soil. A lot of my Asian fossorials, they have um, potting soil as their substrate, and usually I put plants and lots of isopods in there. But since she likes it dry, I can't really add plants in here without, you know, getting it too wet. So I try to cut back so that there won't be a lot of mold. Our water dish. Um, I just put it over in this corner. And I hope that this will hold together. Make her a little bit of a burrow. Yes, definitely with the peat moss, it's holding together much better than if it was just cocoa fiber. So the first time she was in here, when I first got her, she had been rehoused, but I had to take her out because I put a little, I, I think I took out a little bit of the substrate in that case, or I added more, I can't remember. Anyway, I took her out and uh, so that made her very unhappy at the time and she didn't have a burrow. She had to dig her own burrow, so she did a lot of uh, pacing and actually she was chewing a little bit on the wire top of her enclosure. I actually thought she was going to chew her way out and I spent part of the night like that with her in my room at the time because I only had about five tarantulas and I couldn't handle it. I had to move her into the other room because it was very creepy to hear her fangs, you know, just trying to get out all night long. But I think that in this case, since I can dig a burrow in this substrate, she's going to have a, a place to go where she feels good and she'll start webbing it up so it doesn't collapse on her. Which is another thing with the king baboon. A little different than the New World tarantulas is that her burrow has never collapsed on her. So she's very good at webbing without having any cork bark in there to hold it up. I thought about putting cork back in here, but then I thought, well, you know, she, her burrow has been really good for her. She's webbed it really strong, strong webbing, and it never collapsed on her. 
but my new worlds I do put cork bark in there for them okay so what we have here is a very big five and a half gallon tank of dirt Have her flower back. Everything looks fresh. All right. <sighs> Onward. I'll give you a look at her burrow, and there's her new enclosure. So here is the beautiful girl. She's just been crouched like this since I put her in. No threat postures, nothing. All right. make her fall. Come on. All right. Here she comes. She's part way out. Look at that. Oh, girl. I think it's just a way of talking affectionate toward them. I just want her to go out. Come on, girl. Go out. Okay. <laughs> Rehouse the king baboon. <laughs> and here I was. This is going to be so exciting. She's so defensive. Well, this is what happens when you leave your tarantulas alone and you don't harass them. They are calm and just want to go home. So she's in her home and that was easy and it wasn't terrifying at all and she's beautiful. And I hope you got a good look at her when she's running down in there. She's going to be busy redoing this. Can you believe this? I didn't even get a threat posture. Now see, to me, I feel good. I feel good that there were no threat postures out of her. That means that she, she's happy. So I'll have to show you what her burrow looks like in a couple days when I do another video, but I hope you've enjoyed this. So she decided to come out. Um, so I thought maybe Give you a look at her. She looks gorgeous. Very pretty. So you're looking at about a six year old Pelanobius muticus, King Baboon, African species with their big, thick back legs. Look at those legs. So there you have it. There was a successful rehouse of a Pelanobius muticus female, the king baboon. And uh, she just did wonderful. I could not be happier. I wanted to share with you before I conclude this video, a new book that I have. It's kind of sought after. It's rather expensive and it seems there are not a lot of copies out there, but I'm finding it to be very useful. This is a book called Tarantulas Breeding Experience and Wildlife. And this book is by Fred, I don't know if you pronounce his name, Cleeton or Cleton. Um, and Jan, uh, Yannick Sigvold and Jean-Michel Verdez. And these are three French, okay, so it is Cleton. So anyway, they are three French authors. And it says here that they combine the realization and observations made during many journeys to Africa, South America, and Asia undertaken with the aim of studying tarantulas in the wild with many years of keeping these spiders in terraria. They find clear words not only on the subject wild caught versus 
captive bred, but I'll also point out amongst others why handling tarantulas requires certain precautions, as is illustrated on the basis of an envenomation case diary. Aside from information that is fundamental to keeping tarantulas, the book also offers various suggestions as to how parasites in the terrarium may be dealt with, the selection of species that are portrayed in both photographs and as to their husbandry parameters differs from many established publications and includes numerous forms that are known in the terrarium hobby yet have not been scientifically described so far. So they've spent a lot of years, this is a collective experience that they have, um, they've spent many years studying tarantulas in the wild, so they talk about the best um, conditions to keep them in. The photographs are really lovely. Um, they show you the habitats that the animals come from. Now, I know that for me, when I was starting out, I wanted to replicate some of the habitats, and I went online, and I could, it was really hard to find some areas that specifically said these tarantulas were found here. I think the best that I found was on YouTube uh, where a gentleman went out and he explored the habitat of Chromatopelma cyanopubescens and he showed them all around the base of all of these bushes in their burrows with all their webbing. And that was in a kind of a scrubland desert um, area in Venezuela. So that was a very good video. Um, and so, you know, here's one, Haplocosmia nepal. Nepalensis, in its shelter between the bricks. Very nice. Um, so they talk about a lot of stuff in here. They even have, in the back, they have descriptions. Like here's Haplopelma schmitti. Now I know some of the names have changed uh, since then, but um, it'll tell you where they're from, it tells you how big they are, and it tells you how big of a terrarium to keep them in as a minimum requirement. Um, and it tells you temperatures, humidity, it tells you about their, their um, disposition, and then it also tells you about breeding them, like this uh, particular species, the Schmitti, the H. Schmitti, uh, a period of winter rest is facilitated, and then it says that they would be easy to, they call it propagate, to breed. So that is very useful um, to kind of tell with certain uh, genus, you know, basically how they're going to, to need to be treated during uh, breeding. Um, and while they are in the gestation period, the mother's uh, producing the sac. Wonderful book. Like I said, expensive. You can probably expect to pay over $50 for this book, but it is really invaluable. And I'm really grateful to my friend Shane for um, sending me screenshots of a few of these because we've been doing some breeding projects together and those screenshots have really helped me and I just I needed to have the book myself. I'm a book person and I need to feel it and touch it and have it be able to look at it and I I just couldn't stop reading a lot of this and it gives me some great ideas of things to share with you in the future. So, I hope that you've really enjoyed uh, meeting Man Eater, my beautiful king baboon. I might try to get a few more pictures of her once I um, conclude this video. Thank you very much. Oh, she just wants to go and hide under her flower. See, she's very sweet. She just wants to be left alone. Look at her beautiful legs. All right, sweet girl. I'm going to say good night to her, which is actually good morning to her. Good night for me.